houses were once a basic necessity in communities like Verlin. And they, interestingly enough, they were one of the things that was provided often before some other things were as well provided for, like schools and roads. But uh, at any rate, right now, we are one of the communities, the few, relatively few communities that still have our Earth's house, though ours is currently in pieces and coming back together now. Thank you, Barry. So, hi, everybody. I am Mary Reddington. I'm a member of the Hearst House Building Committee. Other members of that committee are Rebecca Von Gelder, Bob Blair, and Dave is kind of an ad hoc committee member consulting with us. He's got a lot of other projects going on, so he's not um, committed full time. So, um, I don't know how many of you have seen any history of the Hearst House to date. Um, but we'll go through a brief history. We'll talk a little bit about the building and what we've done to date and kind of next steps for the building. Um, I have a tendency to project if I'm not loud enough, please let me know. If I'm too fast, which is more than likely the problem will be, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll get started. So Tip Woolheater, who is here with us today, the preservation carpenter who's doing the work for us, had never seen this photo. So I don't know how many of you have seen it. We use it a lot in presentations on the Hearst House, so it kind of seemed like a just a everyday picture to me. So this is where the Hearst House was from 1816 to 1926, I think. So today, like I said, we're going to talk about the Hearst House, do a project update, show the work that's been done, what needs to be done. The good news is, despite the fact that I'm talking, most of the presentation is actually pictures. Um, I am not a historical person by nature, so I did kind of a little homework, like why would a town build a hearse house for a community? And, um, you know, people have always protected their dead. They've always been very re reverent with the dead and, you know, buried them. And so um, in the 17th century in England, people would wash the body themselves. They would wake the body for a period of time. They would dig the grave themselves. They would transport the body. They would bury it. And then they would have some sort of service about the life of the person. And in the early days, the um, the word hearse actually came from a French term, which is H-E-R-S-E, -E, which means harrow, which is kind of a farming tool that has sharp points in it. And another term, H-E-R-C-E, -E, was used for these sharp metal points that were used to hold candles. So obviously around a lot of funerals, there were there would tend to be these H-E-R-C-E, -E, hearse holding the candles. And then that word was eventually became mainstream about the way to transport a body. And in the early days, it was done with uh, what are called burrs. And that was essentially a stretcher with wheels. And you would just, you know, wheel it from your home down to the cemetery and you would bury the body. And I'm assuming the reason wagons became required is because communities got more and more spread out from a town center. And so in the 1800s, like Barry said, communities got together and built these hearse homes, these garages to house the wagon. And this was a service that towns provided to its people, you know, at a time where things were pretty tough for people when somebody was dying. So before Berlin was even a town in 1805, a meeting voted that um, $100 would be granted to the committee of Levi Merriam, Solomon Howe, and Henry Powers to procure said hearse and build a house to keep it in. And from a whole bunch of other reports on other town beating, meetings, we have determined that it, the building was likely placed on the common northwest of the meeting house. And this is gonna put it basically on Woodward Ave somewhere. You can see it was 12 and a half feet long, wide by 16 and a half feet long, which it still is, little shrinkage maybe, 13 feet at the peak, eight feet at the eaves. And you can see it cost um, slightly under $30 to build the Hearst House, which is pretty much what we've spent to date. As you'll see, um, Thomas Pollard was paid for building it, the sum of $22. His son, Steve, was paid $3 to paint it. Um, $15 was given to Amasa Hold for the hearse harness and um, like three and a quarter for some other minor items. 
So 11 years later, so now the building was somehow someplace on Woodward Ave at a special town meeting, because of course we're a town now. It was voted to see whether the town will move the Hearst House to the burying ground. And Jesse Jewett, Solomon Howe, and William Jones were the committee members. And Hollis Johnson gave ground for it. So I'm assuming that means he donated the town. It's talking about a 12-foot swath on the westerly side, which is the um, Linden Street side of the cemetery, if you're facing it. Um, and so the, the town approved it. And that's that picture you saw at the beginning of where it was, uh, close to the road. And it sat there for 110 years. You can see that the town continued to maintain it in 1832. Josiah Babcock was paid $14 for a new harness. Hollis Johnson was paid $72.50. That's when they bought the brand new hearse, I guess, in 1832. And you can see throughout here painting repairs, and these were taken from, um, I think, by June, probably, from some of the public records. In 1926, the town sold the hearse house. And I think it makes a little sense when you think of it according to time, you know, as more immigrants um, came to the United States, a lot of them lived in apartments, not necessarily in our community, but in a lot of places. And so you couldn't wake a body at home. You had to have another place to put it. And that was kind of the creation of funeral homes. And I think that combined with, um, you know, motorized vehicles becoming into fashion, the town didn't need to provide the hearse wagon anymore for its townspeople. And that's me making a historical leap because I didn't read that in any of the town papers. But I'm assuming that's why the building didn't become, um, wasn't important to the town anymore as a service. So it was sold to Bernard Wheeler, which later became the Gill's home. And it was right there across the street at 24 Woodward Ave. In 1973, the society repurchased it and moved it to the old burying ground. And now we get to pictures, finally. So, um... This picture, actually, the two gentlemen were not labeled. They are in further pictures. So you can see, you know, they have a flatbed trailer that they've put right inside the building. And the next picture shows the building. It's actually on site now, but they braced it, basically put it on a flatbed trailer and moved it. Now, the town didn't want it to be put up at the same site right on the street at that time because of wear and tear salt snow, that sort of thing. Plus, um, they wanted better access to the cemetery. And so the, the house was kind of put back in the corner where it was until 2013. So you can see, here's another picture then. That's actually, a, I think it's a, a Roger Wheeler and Son trucks. And it's backed up down there to a, where it is now. This is the street, for those of you that don't know exactly where you are. Rebecca's house, Jane's is on the left. And Jay Tesh's property, the rental, is on the right. And then the next picture is um, Philip Wheeler, Doug Borbin. And I don't know why there's only two people and there's three names there. But, you know, I didn't label all the pictures. So there they are. Oh, you can see is actually Roger Wheeler, Burl and Sand and Gravel. And this is pretty much where it was in place at the old burial ground. This is a little bit um, fuzzy because I blew up the picture much bigger than it should probably have been. And you can see the tomb in the background there. Work was actually done on it. Sills were replaced. New doors were made in 1973. In the 80s, a lot of roof repairs were done. An Eagle Scout project did a lot of cleaning up. And I just learned recently that additional granite was found and put in to kind of support the foundation of the building. But big hurricane in 2012 damaged the building to the point where the society decided it really needed to bring in a professional, which would be Tim Woolheater. So we wanted somebody to restore the building as opposed to just fix elements of it, which is kind of what had been done to date. Tim was actually well known in town. He had done work um, while well, he is a Bennett Street graduate. He's been working for about 30 years on buildings um, focusing on the 17th to 19th century. Um, he worked extensively at Golden Skep Farm. He worked on this building for a period of time. He worked on the 1870 and did some consulting for the 1870. He's done consulting for the Bullard House and some work for the Bullard House maybe at some point. Um, so Tim was well known in town um, and, you know, started here by taking the shingles off the building. And you can kind of get a, a pretty good sense from that photo 
of of the effect of all the damage. Here's another one that shows it kind of listing to the side there. Now the street is out there. We are now at the back of the cemetery. And there's another picture that kind of gives you an idea of a, the slant of it. The window was not original to the Hearst house. The windows were created at some point when it was a garage. So now you can see Tim starting his work disassembling the Hearst house. So the roof had to come down. This is a scribe building, and scribe buildings, every single piece is unique. And so you need to actually catalog all the pieces where they were so we can put the puzzle back together after the rep restorations and stuff are made. So um, Dave Westerling went out and brought from the storage container at Cordelia's. Here's actually a piece of the original siding um, or sheathing, and it's got one of Tim's tags on it. And so he went through, stripped the siding off, then labeled all the sheathing, as you can see him doing there, and cataloged it all. Very impressive. He had to do some mapping here. So, um, you know, those are actual pictures of the different walls, the tags that he included on them, and the one on the right is all the sheathing and the labels for that. More disassembling of the Hearst House. I think everybody was surprised at... Um, the amount of damage that there was. I think this is cool, even though I blew it up too big because it shows you that, you know, these weren't perfectly milled beams. Every beam was not six by six or eight by eight. The beams were the as close as they could get to the size that they wanted. And that's why it was really a scribed building where everything was put together. And if you talk to Tim afterwards, you know, he'll be the one to tell you this is not um, perfect carpentry at all. These are people who were throwing up a shed to keep the Hearst wagon dry. I love this picture just because it kind of <laughs> shows you where it sits in the cemetery or where it sat in the cemetery. You can see that Tim needed to use a lot of bracing, a lot of staging to keep it from falling while he was disassembling it. And then he took it down to the sills. Um, Sills are where a lot of old buildings get into trouble, right? Because a lot of times they're actually sitting on the ground and the moisture damage is extensive. And it was extensive in this. So one of um, uh, one of the things he did with a lot of the boards like this is you can see that epoxy is used to basically maintain the integrity of the old pieces. This is my favorite piece of the building, which I think Tim loves too. This is the ridge pole. And um, I love that it looks like a spider there where he filled it with epoxy. And m my epoxy knowledge is limited to it's a liquid. And you put it on the wood and the old wood absorbs it. And then it's cured with heat and or light and um, becomes hardened. And so you're kind of improving the old wood by making it stronger again. So... Um, that's some of the work that, that Tim did. And one of the things he also had to do was create a complete new flooring system because the old sills, we weren't going to be able to salvage. So um, this was the beginning of the project. It started, like we said, after the hurricane in 2012 when Tim was hired. The work was tagged, or the each piece was tagged and cataloged. It was, um, Tim did an inventory of what sound and damaged and what new timbers would be needed. He did measured drawings and sketches. Then he took all the pieces and just like the Grinch, he put them on his trailer and he brought them back to his workshop in Wales and um, did a lot of repairing of the pieces with epoxy at his shop and also created the new pieces that needed to be replaced. And at that point, the project stalled. So in 2021, the Art and Historical Society was having a meeting and decided to create the Hearst House Building Committee. And as we know, everybody who volunteers in town, we're all trying to do, you know, too much with too few hours in the day. And so by creating a group that was just working on the Hearst House, the board of directors and other people on the society could do other things that needed to be done. And this could be a focus project for a few people. So in December 2021, we formed the committee. In February, we did our, our first milestone, which um, Dave likes to call bringing the building back to Berlin. So we went out to Wales, a bunch of us, and loaded up a trailer with all the elements. 
put them together and brought them back to town. And this is the first of many times we will thank Cordelia's for allowing us to use a, um, a dry trailer on their site so that we could put all the elements in there and they could be protected and so that Tim could work on them locally and we could test fit the building locally before we actually go over to the old burying ground. In the middle of the year, we developed a mission for the project and the building. And then in the fall, um, Tim came back and we actually resumed work on the building. So here we are, taking everything off a trailer and putting it in, um, <laughs> taking it off a truck trailer and putting it in a storage trailer at Cordelia's. And then we created the vision. I will actually read this. I know it's a little long, but um, the Hearst House vision is to share local history with the community through the Hearst House, an important contributing building to Berlin's historic center village. Portions of the town's historical collection will be displayed in this unique venue with rotating exhibits and perhaps someday a period Hearst, plus photos and information on the Hearst House, you know, the period of the time, general funeral and burial facts, customs and superstitions. And we're gonna open it regularly and by request. So we're gonna educate visitors on Berlin's past and really hope to pique some historical curiosity and um, maybe increase membership in the society, donations of curated pieces and interest in the future Bullard House Museum. So we very much see the Hearst House, you know, micro or mini museum as um, a place where the his society can get start having a regular place to display some of its wares until the Bullard House is finished. Memorial Hall is a great venue, especially in winter um, months when we can set things up. Obviously, this building will not be heated, so we will not be storing precious papers in this building, but there are still so many things that we can present that are, you know, um, metal and, and don't need all that controlled environment and stuff. And Barry made a quick list of some of the stuff that's already in the society's, you know, wares. Um, we're hoping that we would open the building on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, which are two obvious times when people gather to remember the dead. And that other times when there's things going on town, I'm a big fan of opening on Halloween. Um, and uh, holidays in Berlin, and just another opportunity to get people excited about history in the town and a place where we can start showing parts of um, the collection, the extensive collection that the town has. So let's see, September, we gathered again. We went into the building, we took all the pieces out again, and we sorted them by wall. And so the north, south, east, west wall, and then the roof. And we tagged them, we color coded them, and and we put them all back into the trailer so that we could bring them out one wall at a time and test fit them. So what we're basically trying to do is you have 200 year old wood, and then we have some stuff that was repaired, and then we have some stuff that Tim created new, so it would might be you know 10 or 15 year old wood. And everything has warped and everything has moved and everything has shifted and everything has twisted. And so what we were trying to do this year was test fit the sections of the building. And Tim then would adjust and scribe with his tools to modify any of the tenons or the mortises or the length of a board. And, you know, 99 times out of 10, do it, modify the new wood, not the old wood. Um, and, and make sure that when we're ready to put it back up in the old burying ground that we know the west wall goes together, the east wall goes together, the north wall, the south, all of that. But it, it took a long time. So um, any good sunny day, Tim would say he was coming out to Berlin and a couple of us or one or two or three of us would go out there and meet him and move all the pieces in the wall out, put them on saw horses. He would or we would level and square it. And then we used a lot of strapping to kind of hold it tight. You can see Bob there with Tim. And then you can see like this is a wall laying horizontally, which is how we test fitted them all. And you can see that this particular wall I wanted to show you to show a lot of new wood combined with the old wood. 
And this is my favorite thing. And I don't know if any of you think this is cool, but I think this is super cool. So um, Tim would be like, oh, there's a level mark, like in 200 year old wood. It'd be like, what are you talking about? But obviously carpenters creating scribe systems would scratch into the wood. So they knew how the pieces went together when they actually raised the building. And so Tim showed us several things. The one on the left is a level mark, which they use to both sides of the building measure level. This is a two foot mark. Again, I didn't even see this little scratch at 24 inches, but you know, it's a 200 year old scratch in wood that shows that it's two feet from the end, which I just think is super cool. And there are some more, they're called marriage marks. So two slashes in a circle means those two go together, four slashes or three and a half in a circle mean those two go together. Um, but I just think that's very cool. So after we did the walls, we started working on the roof and the ridge pole. And um, this was a little challenging for us because we only have so many hands. So what we would do is lay all the pieces out like this, and then um, Tim or Bob or somebody had the brilliant idea to bring in a couple of ladders. And so you can see the blue ladder behind Bob's head. So we use two eight foot ladders, maybe 10 foot ladders, six foot ladders to hold the ridge pole while we move certain pieces in. And the other thing that's cool to see here is there's a piece of metal there halfway down that. And Tim makes these metal pins that you can use temporarily as pegs to hold them until you get, um, the physics and enough pieces together so it holds itself together. Um, but this part was so challenging because one entire side of the roof had really rotted, all the ridge pole, all the um, root rafters. And so the ridge pole went like, whoop, it was like a huge curve. And um, one of the things we learned very quickly is you can't drop 200 year old beams because they, they just break. And so we would just kind of be holding on to them and using the ladders to brace it and, and putting it all together. And we did get it to go together and Tim scribed this whole side towards me. Those are all new rafters. The old ones are on the older, the other side, I think. Yeah. And on the ends. Right. Um, but then Tim, um, said, Hey, if only we had a nice warm place that we could keep this all winter. Because, and, and I was like, well, if we had one of those, we wouldn't have been working out of a trailer. But um, Tim Wheeler happened to be there again, Cordelia's farm. And he said, hey, the society is going to put some stuff in Village Power. You can set it up in Village Power and leave it there all winter. And one of the things that Tim talks about is how wood has memory. And so we re-erected it inside Village Power, put all of this strapping on it, and the you know, the hope is that the bizarre curves and stuff that we don't want to pull too much on will kind of relax back into their original shape and that this will be ready to go when we're ready to put it back up in the spring. Yeah. Um, so that's the year. So that took us till this fall. I think it was early December when we actually put it up in, in Village Power. But there's so much to be done. Um, here's a list of a lot of things that we need to do, but I kind of put some uh, timing on it. So I'll skip to that after we talk about money. So basically the society has spent about $25,000 on the building to date. And if we wanted a shed, we could have gone to Lowe's and bought a shed, but we didn't want a shed. We wanted this historical building to be preserved and to be put back in the center of town. And those of you who have done anything in the last couple of years know the cost of materials has gone up extensively. So with us estimating what the sheathing will cost, what the roofing will cost, what um, the material for the doors, all those things, we're estimating about another ten to 12000 in materials. Um, that doesn't mean we can't skimp, but we're hoping we don't have to. We could put um, an asphalt roof on it and save money because cedar shingles are very expensive. In fact, you can't really get them. But the society is going to decide as a group once we get 
real detailed us right now when I send out and I say, hey, can you give me an estimate? They're like, oh, that job's way too small. We won't even estimate it for you. I mean, you can't believe the amount of places I have sent emails to. So once we get a little, a little bit um, closer, we will get some tight numbers and then the society will decide, do we want to um, go with a less expensive update to the building? But we still have all these things we need. We're going to need crushed stone, granite, which we might get from Tom Mills, shiplap for the sheathing and the flooring, materials for the doors, period elements for the doors and hinges. We have some things, but we'll have to maybe either have stuff custom made or go through and try to find some period elements for the hinges and stuff. Um, the corner boards, the rake boards, the fascia boards, all of which means nothing to me, but Tim and I talked about at length. Um, and paint, of course. So um, I know it looks like a lot of money. I think we all need to remind ourselves of the importance of these kind of projects in a town like ours that really puts history as a focus of and preservation of as what we want to do. And that, you know, everything costs more money than we think. I was looking at some of the CPA fund spending and, you know, $100,000 to do the basketball court and the tennis courts and $20,000 to put up a scoreboard and an announcer booth for baseball. Things are expensive. So um, so what are we going to do? Um, in the early part of the new year, we still have a lot of things to do. We need to really get a surveyed cemetery site plan, which we luckily have an engineer on our team here. We need to get the site plan approved by the society and talk to the town about town board approvals. We're talking about an ownership agreement. And... Um, there are two members of the select board here, but they can't talk to it because that makes them like a meeting. So um, the what we're thinking is the town isn't interested in taking on another old building to maintain, as, as you might imagine. And the town's insurance company doesn't think it's the best idea for private buildings to be located on public lands. So we're working with um, the town administrator and um, another society member who's a lawyer here on creating an agreement that works for everybody. So the Art and Historical Society is going to finish the building. This is our proposal. This is not approved yet. Finish the building on the old burying ground. Once the building is finished, transfer it to the town. And the society has also agreed to maintain it for the first 20 years. And then if any of us are still alive, we'll vote to continue to maintain it. So, and we'll create a maintenance schedule for it. But that's something we've got to work on this winter. Um, communications to the townspeople. I mean, this I think is exciting stuff. And so um, I've started a website, which I haven't made live obviously, because I haven't talked to the society about it, but Janet up and I are going to work on a website that will include historical society and historical commission. So we can have updates on both the Bullard house and the Hearst house. For those of you that followed the 19 Carter, we wrote a blog to, you know, follow the story of that. And, you know, people, it becomes real to people when you start seeing pictures of the building coming together. So um, we're going to work on that this winter. We're going to continue to look for grant funding opportunities. The problem is the building's not, his, it's a historical building without a historical title. So a lot of those monies that the state offers, it has to be already declared a historical building. But we're hoping to look at some smaller grants that might help with painting it or signage or stuff like that. Um, we're actually talking about some locally milled boards. So um, uh, Marsha had said at one of our meetings, you know, Tim Wheeler has a sawmill. And he just makes his own boards. And I was like, huh. So didn't I see Tim at the post office putting up his own boards on a fence? And I was like, hey. Um, and he said Henry Pacific even has a bigger and better sawmill. So Tim said, yeah, it's a little tight because it, the wood wouldn't have a lot of time to dry if we're hoping to reinstall this building next year. But if they do cut some boards um, in the early part of the winter, six months would be enough to do like the sheathing for the walls and the roof where you're going to put another layer on top of it anyway probably not the floors because the gaps would continue to widen as the wood dried. Um, but Tim Wheeler is talking to Henry Pacific as apparently Henry has a, even a newer sawmill and some other new gadgets for his bobcat to pick up stuff and he wants to play. So um, we're talking to them. 
We're going to look at the old 1805 stuff. We just had a brief conversation with Tim. You know, some of these boards are in pretty good shape. Um, will we use them on the outside? Will we kind of mount them inside so people can see the original boards? This one is, you really can't see, but some of the boards actually have red in them. So we think the building was painted red at some point. Um, we're going to determine all the final materials and purchase and order all the materials. In the spring, we're hoping to do site prep. Re-erect the house. Uh, basically, the way Tim says it goes is once the site is prepped, he'll bring the new floor. We'll get it level. We'll put one layer of sheathing for flooring so that we can stand in it. Bring in bracing. Bring in um, scaffolding. And then, you know, it's our hope as a committee that we can have a barn raising to do at least one or two walls and invite the community because, as Tim says, it won't take long if we have some strapping young 20-year-olds versus the rest of us picking up the beams and carrying them like this, which is what we did all winter, all fall. So um, we'll start with the, the base, put up the walls, then the roof, um, do the sheathing on the roof, shingles. We'll need to build new doors. Um, the, and then there's trim that Tim's going to look back at, and we're going to look at some pictures and see you know, how much of the trim we can replicate or not, and then hopefully transfer ownership to the town. And then in the fall, obviously there will not be electricity at this building, there will not be heat at this building. So I foresee us having, you know, some some solar lanterns that when we're open, we pop up inside. Um, I know Patrick and I have like this baby generator like this. So when your electricity goes out, you can plug a few things into it so that we can have some light, maybe have a few space heaters, depending upon whether we're open in, in a winter's day. And then some other things that our committee is just tossing around as hopefully future things that we might do. We'll apply for um, the Registry of Historic Places, um, a walking tour of the cemetery where, you know, we select a few graves and the hearse house is included. We might profile high profile individuals, babies, soldiers, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, the signage at the Hearst House, we would like to there be connecting signage in the village for the other properties and a walking tour of the town, and maybe buy a period Hearst at some point. So, like Barry said, we're really fortunate. Even Sturbridge Village doesn't have a Hearst House, and this is, you know, it predated the Powder House. Um, and this little building, I think, is an important part of our town's preservation when we talk about history. And frankly, this line is from the press release that I think maybe Rebecca wrote. When completed, the Hearst House will stand as a reminder of a time when the town took an active role in providing the necessary services to its people on the occasion of death, which is kind of cool. So we have Tim Woolheater here, who is the preservation carpenter who's worked and working on the building. We have a lot of members of the society here who have worked on this project over the past time. And um, if anyone has any questions, we can talk to them.